Well, good morning. For those of you who are new here at the Shepherd's Church, my name is Les Lofquist, and I'm a professor here at Shepherd's Theological Seminary. I teach practical theology courses, and I also serve on the church's pastoral staff in the area of membership and assimilation. In this uh, year's summer series, I've been assigned the seventh quality of the fruit of the Spirit uh, from Galatians 5, 22 and 23. Uh, to introduce my message, I'd, I'd like you to consider the life of John G. Payton. John Payton, who died in 1907, was from Scotland, and he served for 30 years as a missionary in the South Pacific in the New Hebrides Islands that today we call Vanuatu. This island chain is 500 miles west of Fiji and 1,100 miles east of Australia. And so it's out kind of in the middle of the South Pacific and nowhere. During the time that John Payton lived, these islands were filled with people who commonly practiced cannibalism and the killing of newborn babies for all sorts of superstitious reasons and the sacrifice of newly widowed wives after the death of their husbands. Less than 25 years before Peyton arrived in Vanuatu, or the New Hebrides, the first two missionaries came to the island, and the island people clubbed them to death, clubbed those two men to death, just 15 minutes after they landed on the shore. The native people then cooked and ate the murdered men, as the sailors on the ship that brought them watched in horror. News of this grisly death of the two Scottish missionaries spread throughout all of Great Britain, and uh, churches were appalled. Nevertheless, a successful young Scottish pastor named John Payton determined to leave Glasgow, Scotland, to minister to this unreached people group in the New Hebrides Islands. As you can imagine, most of his Christian friends in Scotland urged him to do something more sensible with his life. At the end of his life, after 30 years, Peyton wrote a book, 30 Years Among South Sea Cannibals. In his book, he wrote about how the folks at his church in Scotland sought to convince him not to go. Listen to what he says. Amongst many who sought to deter me was one dear old Christian gentleman whose crowning argument always was, the cannibals, you'll be eaten by cannibals. At last I replied to this brother, Mr. Dixon, you are advanced in years now, and your own prospect is that soon you will be laid in the grave, and there your body will be eaten by worms. <laughs> I confess to you that if I can but live and die, serving and honoring the Lord Jesus, it will make no difference to me whether I'm eaten by cannibals or eaten by worms in the ground. And in the great day, my resurrection body will arise as fair as yours in the likeness of our risen Redeemer. While well, John Payton lived to see Christ transform that entire culture, and to witness hundreds of global workers who followed behind him. What was it about this man that led him to do this? I think we see that right there in his words. It was his faith in Christ's resurrection power that led to obedience. He said that. He, he said, I, I, I believe that my resurrection body will arise just like yours. And so it was his faith that led to faithfulness. His obedient faith led to a life of faithfulness. And that led to lives of faith and faithfulness and many other people who watched him. This illustrates the seventh characteristic of the fruit of the Spirit, which is faith. And the New Testament teaches increasing faith will lead to increasing faithfulness in the life of a believer by the power of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to the book of Galatians, chapter 5, as we continue the summer series on the fruit of the Spirit. And listen to Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit 
is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness. There's our word, and I have the English Standard Version here in front of me. The King James and the New King James has faith, faith, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. As you look at the use of this word, faith or faithfulness, translated both ways, here in Galatians 5, it's important to note that the Greek word for faith that we see here is used 243 times in the New Testament. But only three times in the New Testament is this word translated faithfulness. And so I was puzzled as I started to study this. I said, wow, the preponderance of, of evidence, 243 times, only three times was it translated faithfulness. And uh, the King James, as I said, the New King James translates this word faith. And that describes belief and allegiance toward God. While the more modern translations, the New American Standard and the English Standard Version translates this word faithfulness, that describes a life of reliability and dependability. One translation is pointing toward God, and the other is pointing toward the believer's life of faithfulness. So what's the best translation? Well, I think there are traces of both meanings in this word. Both faith as our reliance on God and faithfulness as a growing characteristic of our life by the power of the Holy Spirit. I think you can see a little of both. So let's amplify this a little bit by looking at the chapter in the Bible we often call the faith chapter. It's Hebrews chapter 11. And that's where we're going to spend the rest of the morning here. So turn to Hebrews chapter 11 and see how the word is used there. Turn with me there to Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11, the first verse that we read is uh, in Hebrews 11, verses 1 and 2. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it, the people of old received their commendation. And uh, th these are, are familiar verses. Uh, first thing, you might just kind of skip over that very first word, now. See, that sets the context. It, it drives us immediately preceding to the words preceding, chapter 10. Chapter 10, take a look at verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence. See, the book of Hebrews was written to people who came out of a Jewish background, Hebrews. And they were in this time of transition. And they were kind of wavering back and forth. Should we stay in the temple? Should we go through the sacrificial system? Or should we instead identify with local assemblies that we call church? What is it? What, what, what should we do? And so here in verse uh, chapter 10, 35, don't throw away your confidence. Don't go back to Judaism. Don't go back to that religious system. Don't go back to the sacrificial system of the Old Testament. We have the high priest. We have the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, sacrificed once for all for our sins. Don't go back. Don't throw away your confidence. Verse 36 of chapter 10. You have need of endurance. You need to stick with it. So how do you have endurance? Well, you see, in verse 38, my righteous one shall live by faith. Verse 39, we are not of those who shrink back. We're not destroyed. We're, we're not those who are losing confidence and going backwards. We're those who have faith. Now, faith, in chapter 11, verse 1, now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. And so what we see here is uh, these words that uh, oftentimes are called a definition. These are familiar verses often referred to as the biblical definition of faith. But I respectfully disagree with seeing these verses that way. I don't believe these verses are a definition of faith. Rather, I believe these verses describe faith. You see, a definition precisely explains the full meaning of a word. While a description 
focuses on several, but not all, the elements of a word. So Hebrews 11, 1 and 2, is a description of some of the elements of faith, but not all the elements of faith. And so here in Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, we see four elements in the description of faith. Remember, not a full and complete definition of faith, but a description. So I see four elements in the description of faith here in these verses. So let's look at the first one. The first element in the description of faith is the foundation of faith. We see that in those words, faith is the assurance of things hoped for. There we see the foundation of faith. This word faith is used uh, 25 times in chapter 11. And we already saw the context. The context was they're wavering back and forth, wondering what they should do in this time of transition. And chapter 11 says, have faith. That faith should drive you to obedience. And so, uh, as we begin just taking a look at this word faith, faith is not some spiritual power force. It's not some commodity that we fill up on. It's not some, some, some substance that we can hold on to. It's not reliance on yourself. In fact, faith is the end of the reliance on yourself. It's not faith in a feeling, oh, I just feel, I just feel it. Something's going to happen. I just feel it. That's not faith. Faith instead is an end of your self-reliance. It's an end when you say, I have it figured out. I am capable. I understand. I know. And it's about me at that point. That's not faith. Faith is an end of of the reliance when you say I I don't I don't have strength I don't have knowledge I don't I'm not sovereign in myself I I don't have that I'm I'm ending my self-reliance and instead it's a reliance on a person of infinite power see this person described in verse 3 it says by faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God. He spoke. Universe. He spoke. Came stars. He spoke. Came the earth. He spoke. There were animals. He spoke. And there were humans. He spoke. By faith we understand the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen is not made out of things that are visible. So faith is an end of yourself and a reliance on this awesome, majestic Lord God Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. Faith is saying this majestic, glorious creator God, the transcendent God who is far above and beyond us. Verse 6 of chapter 11. Without faith, it's impossible to please him for whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. So you, are, you reach the end of yourself and you turn to this great majestic creator God and you say, I know he exists. And by faith, I, I recognize that he spoke everything that I see into existence. So you recognize by faith, who's this person? But you also by faith recognize he has communicated in an authoritative written revelation we call the Bible. It's authoritative because it's from him. It's written you have it, many of you, on your laps or on your phone. It's written. You can read it. And it's his revelation. He reveals truth to us that we otherwise would not know. And so back to this idea of the foundation of faith. Faith faith's not a blind leap. It's not a blank check. It's not a bad choice. Let me go through that again. Faith is not a blind leap. It's a leap, yes, into the arms of the Lord God Almighty. 
this majestic person. It's not a blind leap. It's not a blank check that you can do whatever you want and, and call it faith and, and so, as so many people erroneously talk about today. Faith's not a, a blank check. It's, it's not a bad choice. It's not a bad choice like Mr. Dixon was trying to convince Pastor John Payton in Scotland. It's a bad choice. The cannibals, the cannibals. Not a blind leap, a blank check, or a bad choice. It's a recognition. You're at the end of yourself. It's a humble response of obedience to the promises of God. It's based on the firm foundation of the person of God and his word. It's not wishful thinking, but confident trust in God. <clears throat> Hebrew word that is, you, you know it. When I say it to you, you'll say, oh, that's a Hebrew word. Amen. Amen. That's from the Old Testament, Hebrew Bible. Basically means truth. So be it. I, I agree. It's true. So faith says amen to everything that God says. And we see then this, this foundation of faith. Where do I get that? It's, it's in that word. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. That's a Greek word, hypostasis. Now, I'm not just showing off. I just want you to see something. Hypostasis. Hupo means under. Stasis comes from the, the idea of stand. So hypostasis is, is something underneath upon which you can stand. It's a foundation. So that's why I call this the foundation of faith. The foundation. It's this foundation. Also, interestingly... In the first century, the way this word hypostasis was used is a business document. A business document. It's evidence of ownership. A title deed. Isn't that interesting? Because it means a foundation upon which you can build a building. But it also means after the building's built and you want to sell it, you hand them a title deed and you say, oh yeah, I own it. Here, you can buy it. Give me the money. I'll give you the deed to prove you own it. So what's the idea there? is that the title deed underlies everything in the sale. And so this idea of hypostasis is the foundation upon which you build a building, and it's the title deed upon which you can put together and finalize a sale. Faith is the foundation of things hoped for. It, that's also very interesting in the construction because what it is, it's actually... A, a participle, present participle, that means it's continuing action. So I don't know why they didn't translate it that way. They said, faith is the foundation of things that we continually are hoping for. It's a passive voice. So it means that it's not something that's about me. It's passive, but it's also present. And it's a participle. I'm, I'm looking forward to, continually looking forward with confidence, certainty. The foundation of faith. That's the first element in the description of faith. The second element in the description of faith is also found in verse 1. Let me read it for you. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Now here it is, the second element. The conviction of things not seen. Conviction, that word is used uh, seven, no, 19 times in the uh, New Testament. 17 times as a verb, 2 times as a noun. It means Usually it's translated to be rebuked or to be convicted or to be convinced. And so the idea behind the word is that someone says something external from you, they say it, and you are internally convinced. They're saying it, and then you say, yeah, that's right. So, Faith is the conviction of things not seen. It's the inward confidence from God. It's confidence from God that what he's promised, he's going to perform. He'll keep his word. It's not a vague kind of hope. It's a convicted conviction, confidence, it's something that you have internally. You say, that's right. Like the Hebrews would say, amen, amen. Let me tell you a little bit about myself and how it kind of uh, fits in with this verse. 
I was raised in Minnesota. Oh, boy, I just said it the way they say it, too. <laughs> Minnesota. <laughs> I was raised in Minnesota. It's always the O's with the Minnesotans. Hey, I never knew that. I thought everyone was just kind of making that up. They'd say to me in college, hey, you have an accent. I don't have an accent. You suppose I have an accent? Oh, no. No, I don't. <laughs> and so I didn't know that. <clears throat> and I was hanging out with a bunch of people in Michigan. And then I came back to Minnesota, and I was standing at a Dairy Queen ice cream place to get some ice cream. And the guy, uh, the guy who was asking for, the, the, you know, the guy who's running the, the shop said, oh, you want a cone? And the other guy said, oh, I suppose. And I went, whoa, I do have that. That's me. So I grew up there. I grew up in Minnesota. Um, and while I was there, I did a little dabbling in Sunday school and stuff like that, but I really didn't believe it. And then in ninth grade, that was it. I never went back. And I had nothing to do with God, Jesus, Bible. It meant nothing to me. Um, and if anyone talked about it, it was, I just look at them like they were well, totally irrelevant to whatever I was doing. And uh, that changed in my junior year of high school. There were some Christians they started sharing with me the story that God sent his son to die in my place for my sin. That the penalty that should fall on me would not fall on me, but instead fell upon him, Jesus. And then to prove that it was, it was accepted by God, Jesus rose from the dead. <laughs> I, I said, first off, um, you said something about sinners? That's not me. I'm, I'm not a sinner. I mean, really. I mean, I, I, I was pretty popular in high school. <laughs> and, you know, I thought, I'm pretty great. <laughs> and so, um, that wasn't me. Oh, that's that guy who gets drunk every weekend. That girl over there sleeps with all the guys in the football team. That guy's mom uh, is an alcoholic. That guy's dad uh, beats his wife. That, that's the sinner, not me. And uh, so I had nothing to do with it. Well, these Christians gave me a Bible. I wasn't going to read it. I didn't need it. No way I did I need the Bible. But um, after a year and a half, I just picked it up and started reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the story of Jesus Christ literally coming to this earth in a real place, Israel, that you can go visit today. And Jesus Christ did these things, attested to by these eyewitnesses who wrote it down. And I trusted Christ as my Savior. I'm so grateful. Well, Remember, I lived a life of scoffing and mockery. A week after I became a Christian, I was sharing the great news with a friend. And uh, she was raised Catholic. And she, as I was talking to her, the more I talked to her, she just started frowning more and more at me. Until finally she said, I just don't buy it. I, I can't believe what you're saying. You mean to tell me, she said, you believe in Adam? And you believe in Jonah in the belly of the whale? Well, I hadn't really thought about that. <laughs> I, that wasn't my concern when I was coming to Christ. It was about my sin and my need for a savior. And so for the first time in my life, I was confronted. Do you believe in Adam in the book of Genesis? Do you believe in Jonah in the book of Jonah being swallowed by that great fish? She said, do you really believe that? And it took me about three seconds, and I, I looked at her and said, if it's in the Bible, yes, I believe it. I hadn't even thought about that till that very second. What had happened to me? I had been changed by the indwelling Holy Spirit when I became a Christian. And all of a sudden now, I had this confidence in the Word of God that I didn't have before. And I said, yes, I believe it. So... Confidence, it's conviction of things not seen. It's a foundation of faith. The first element in this description of faith. The confidence of faith. Here, the second one. Now let's take a look at the third element in the description of faith. 
Verse 2. For by it, that's faith, the people of old received their commendation. The people of old received their commendation. That's talking about the response that they had. The response of faith. The people of old, by the way, there's 19 people or groups of people mentioned in chapter 11. So the people of old he's talking about are there. And um, they received their commendation. That, I'm going to... Doing more Hebrew or Greek than I usually do, but I want to tell you the Greek verb there that's part of this word, commendation. Greek word is martyreo, martyr, eo. You can kind of hear it, martyr, eo. Eo makes it a verb. Martyr. It's someone who testifies, bears witness, often at a price, a martyr's death. Faith then is not a matter of passive opinion. You just don't go, yeah. That's, that's for me. It's a decisive, obedient action. It's a response. You go beyond merely acknowledging facts and you say, yes, I will do what that book says for me to do. I will obey God. Even if it costs me my life as a martyr, I will respond with obedience well, this word, uh, martyreo, is a verb. The, the noun form is used in the next chapter, Hebrews 12. Take a look in verse 1. Therefore, connecting it all back to chapter 11, therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. There's our word, martyr, the, in the plural form, great cloud of witnesses. These 19 people and groups of people mentioned here. They're testifiers. They're people who obeyed. There are people who said, I'm at the end of my own resources. I don't, know, I don't know what I can do on my own. I cannot do anything, but I testify that I will obey. Remember the context in chapter 10, verse 36, about endurance, confidence. Faith is the, the response to that. How to have endurance? You obey, you respond in faith specifically to this book, to the Hebrews, the writer's saying, don't go back to Judaism. Don't go back. Get out of the temple. Stop going there for sacrifices. There's no more sacrifices. Christ is it. And so, specifically, it's saying, respond in faith by obedience. Respond with faith. Respond with obedience. Respond with faithfulness. See how faith leads to faithfulness? I see that both concepts in that word. What's the opposite of faith? What's what I had before I trusted Christ as my Savior? Prideful disbelief. I'm not going to read that book. They gave it to me. It took me a year and a half to read it. I'm not going to read it. They'd say, why? I don't have to read that. It's a bunch of legends, a bunch of maybe even lies, myths. I don't need to read that thing. For a year and a half, that's what I said. Prideful disbelief. I know better. I'm going to make a decision here, and I've made a decision. That's not truth. That's not for me. I determine truth. That's the opposite of faith led to arrogant mockery. Arrogant mockery. I can remember when uh, one of these Christians was a girl and in the library at my high school, she was talking to me about the Bible, but I, I just, I played football, basketball, you know, I just swore like a crazy guy and just swore all the time in front of her. And she said, you know, God says that every idle word you speak will be held against you in the day of judgment. I said, are you kidding? The, the air that comes out of my lungs, that goes across my larynx, that comes out and is shaped, the air that's shaped by my tongues and my teeth and my lips becoming words. You, you're saying the air? I'm going to be judged by God? And she said, yes. So I said, okay, how about this? And I literally looked up and I said, hey, God! And then like an arrogant, cocky junior in high school I, I used four-letter words, some that started with F. 
I said that to God. That was me. I know better than you. You're not going to tell me what to do. That was me. That's the opposite of faith. That's prideful disbelief. So the response of faith. First, the foundation, then the, sec- the confidence, and then the response of faith. Let's take a look here at the fourth element in the description of faith. The victory of faith. All those people. All those people in chapter 11. You see them. You see like verse uh, 4, Abel, verse 5, Enoch, verse 7, Noah, verse 8, Abraham, verse 11, Sarah, verse uh, number 18, Isaac, verse 21, Jacob, verse 22, Joseph, verse 23, Moses, verse 29, the people crossed the Red Sea, that's the nation of Israel, verse 30, by faith the walls of Jericho, reference to Joshua, verse 31, by faith Rahab the prostitute, verse 32, Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, and the prophets. All those people are mentioned, and even those who, who died without seeing uh, victory, there they are at the end of chapter 11. All these people represent victory, victory of faith. And how is that? Why do I say that? Because remember I told you the verb martyr, eo, martyr eo? It's used in a passive sense, meaning They were born witness to. It's kind of awkward, but that's what it means. They were born witness to. In verse 4, used twice. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. Who commended him? God did. It was passive. God did the commending. God commending him by accepting his gifts. Verse 5, Enoch, the same thing. He was commended by God. Verse 39, we see the same thing. These commended through their faith. All of these commended by God. God bore witness to their faith, gained them victory. Approval from God, despite the challenges, despite the opposition, despite the ridicule. Faith plus obedience led to faithfulness and victory in their lives. God's commendation. So, as we look at Hebrews chapter 11, let's take a look again at the four elements in the description of faith. The foundation of faith, the confidence of faith, the response of faith, the victory of faith. Is this you? Faith, obedience, faithfulness? Or do you like the way I was? Prideful disbelief. There was another man in Scotland, a Scotsman who lived at the time of John Payton where we started, This man's name was William Ernest Henley. When he was 16, he had his leg amputated because of an infection. And they said, you know, your other leg may also be amputated. And so his response, he turned to poetry and he started writing poetry. He wrote a very famous poem. When I start reading it, I think a number of you will know. William Ernest Henley wrote this poem called Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, Black as the pit from pole to pole. I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I've not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. Talking about death. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, an allusion to Jesus' words in Matthew. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And so, that's one Scotsman. Now think back to that Scottish pastor, John Payton, in Glasgow. His conversation at the beginning I read, talked to Mr. Dixon. His own statement is that his faith in the resurrection of Christ, the power of Christ, led to his obedience to follow the call of God from Scotland to the South Pacific cannibals. His faith and obedience led to his life 
of spirit-controlled faithfulness in the New Hebrides Islands. John Payton exemplifies a life of a believer who in faith is obedient. Consequently, the fruit of the Spirit flourished in his life, which led to a life of faithfulness. So we have the unconquerable soul of William Ernest Henley, or the conquered soul, submission to Jesus Christ of John G. Payton, both Scotsmen. Which one will it be for you? Which one is like you? Are you like Henley? Or are you like Peyton? Where is your faith? In your strength? Or in that wonderful, almighty Lord God of the universe?